when God lays his hand on you, when God lays his hand on you, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for a miracle tonight. I pray for all the young people, all the boys, all the girls, all the teenagers in this place, that you would speak to them, Holy Ghost. And when they leave this church tonight, they will never be the same. And I pray, Lord, for the young people, the young married couples, the singles. I pray for the adults, for every one of us here. God, you had a reason for laying this message on my heart. You spoke it to me and you said, preach it and I will bless it and I will anoint it tonight. It's a simple message. But God, when you lay your hand on somebody, what a wonder it is. What an incredible thing to have God come down, put his hand on us and change us so that we're never the same. Put your hand on young people tonight. Put your hand on people all through this congregation. Lord, stretch out your hand Touch them, let the fire of your hand burn, let the fire of your hand mark them for life, that they'll never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's nothing greater for a boy, a girl, a teenager, a young person, adult. There's nothing greater on earth, as far as I'm concerned, than to have the hand of God placed upon you. To have the hand of God placed touch you. The touch of his hand changes your life forever. You can never after that uh, be the same. I, I've, I've shared with this congregation a few times, I think, of that I, I remember the time and the place. I remember all the circumstances when Jesus laid his hand on me when I was eight years old. In fact, I went back uh, just uh, a year or so ago, back to that spot after all these years. I remember that spot. And it's how it, I went back recently last year, and I knelt right at that spot, and I began to break again just as I did when I was eight years old. And evangelist said, come and give your life. And there's something in me rose up and said, God, I want to give my life. And I was only eight years old, and it was at the Living Waters Campground Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania. And I walked down. There was nothing but a dirt floor, sawdust, and straw on the floor. And nobody recognized who I was. I was just a skinny little kid. I had big horn rim glasses that had those look like bottoms of Coke bottles. I mean, that thick. Your eyes look like little bug eyes when you look at them from the other side. I was so skinny. I was a, 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 I was a, I really, they mocked me in school. They made fun of me. Nobody would have known that skinny little horium glass kid with big ears. Now, you don't know how big my ears are. I have them covered. I've learned to comb my hair, so you can't tell. And I'm not about to stick it back and show you. Nobody that night would have known that little scared boy who was at times confused, thought nobody uh, could see him, that, that there was nothing, uh, really just felt awkward, very awkward, because I they made so much fun of me in school, and to walk down, nobody noticed me kneeling there, but the Holy Ghost did. Jesus heard my cry, and I lifted my hands and said, Jesus, I'm eight years old, but I want you to use my life. I want to preach like my dad preaches and like my granddad preaches. And I want to be a minister. I want you to touch me. And as soon as I prayed that, Spirit of God came on me and filled me with the Holy Ghost mightily. And I began to speak uh, another language of heaven. And I fell over. I remember by the power of the Holy Ghost, I was just laying in the sawdust and straw. And a gray-haired man, Daddy Chase, he was a superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Pennsylvania District. And he came up and laid hands on me. I still remember getting up on that white-haired man. And he prophesied over me and said, God, use this young man. You heard his cry and used him. And he prophesied over me. Now, I got up that. I, I, I thought it was at least an hour and a half or two hours that I laid there. I don't know. But I, I know that that night, 
Jesus touched me. Jesus put his hand on me. I remember, now that didn't turn me into a saint. I didn't get up and was changed in any way. I still had the little David Wilkerson temper I always had. I remember the next day going out and playing football with my brother Jerry on the campground. And and uh, nobody would have thought, I didn't think anything great about it. I didn't say, well, hey, something changed my life last night. I'm going to be a preacher. But I knew something had happened at all. To the, I'd been touched. And it would be for life. God made this little mind of mine to understand that. And, and I have understood that all through my life. I have, from that time on, yes, I had problems. I had problems in school. I barely made it through school. My grades were terrible. And, uh, no, no problem confessing. There's no teacher going to catch up with me now. And, um, <laughs> I got no penalty to pay, I can tell you. I barely got through school. And uh, my last year, I don't even know how they kept me in school. I skipped half my senior year playing hooky. Now, I'm trying to just tell you that I wasn't a saint. But I remember when I was 10, 12, 15 years of age, every time I go to the house of God, there was something pulling, tugging at my heart. And I never forgot the time that he touched me. And there was something rising up, and I knew that I always loved the Lord. There was a heart for God. And when I was about 15 years old, I remember getting alone when other kids were praying, and I would go in my room and pray and seek God. The Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I do know that I would read my Bible. I would go in the book of Psalms. I loved to read about the kings in, in Kings and, and, and uh, Deuteronomy, or rather uh, Chronicles. And I still love reading through the kings and Chronicles and those stories of David and Samson and those intrigued me and I would I would preach my little sermons when I was 17 year old. I I God opened the door so I could begin to preach, but I am here in this pulpit tonight because the Lord put His hand on me. Jesus touched me when I was eight years old. And that's why I'm here. And every every day of my life now, ever since I've been in New York, for example, there's not a day goes by when I'm in prayer that the Lord keeps whispering, the Holy Spirit keeps saying, David, I have my hand on you. My hand is on you. Every problem I've faced in this church in the past uh, nine, ten years since we've been here, any time there's been difficult or anything else, this is what God has always told me. I go to him with every trouble, every everything, and he would say, David... I've got my hand on you. You walk enveloped in my hand. My hand is upon you. My hand. I feel his hand on me right now. The hand of God, the hand of Jesus was placed on my heart. You, you're sitting here tonight. You say, I don't know if that's ever happened to me. D- David could, could say uh, very clearly, he said, you have enclosed me behind and before You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. That's Psalms 139, verses 5 and 6. David knew something had happened. I don't know where it happened. It's probably happened out when he was watching sheep. He's out there and he's just a boy. And God began to open his heart and draw him and, and make him know that he was going to be different. Not that he was going to be uh, some great personality or anything like this, but it was going to be different in that he had a heart for God. That the hand of the Lord would be put upon him. And, and he said, you, you have closed me in. You've beset me before and behind. And what David's saying, somewhere in my past, and he may have remembered, he may not. But he said, you closed me into yourself. You, you put your spirit around me and you surrounded me. So that I was shut up with you, God. And when you shut me into yourself, you put your hand on me. And he said, the thought of that is too much for me. And I stand here and I think of the hand of God upon me. The souls he's allowed me to reach. The drug addicts, they're being one to the Lord around the world. I don't boast in my flesh. But I thank God for one day, a skinny, scared little boy walks down an aisle. And I just cried, Jesus, touch me, put your hand upon me. He heard that cry. 
And he'll hear your cry tonight if you pray it because he's no respecter of persons. Now I have four children. God touched all their lives. All sharing in the ministry. Now I've got 11 grandchildren. And I want every one of those grandsons that are here tonight to know that there's not a day your grandpa doesn't pray for you. And I pray God make a preacher out of every one of you. Little Ashley and, 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 and David and, and uh, Brandon. I say little, they're big guys now, but when, I mean, when they were little, I, I used to make them preach. I mean, from three or four years old, and they'd open a song book and preach out of a song book. And, and we would be there and we would sing and clap and even let them take an offering. And I want you to know your grandpa knew what he was doing. Uh huh. Now that whole time I was saying, Jesus, put your hand on him, like you put it on me. I remember the day that Ashley's father, my son Gary, was with me in a crusade. He didn't go too many times, but I was down in Asbury College, and I preached that night, and hundreds of college kids came to the Lord, and I'm standing there, and I'm looking down. And there's a little boy, and I, I think there's a little kid down there with all those college students, and in front, he's crying, he's had his hands up. It was Gary. And that night, Jesus put his hand on him. He was about my age. Hallelujah. And maybe tonight, what happened again? I'm not preaching just to my grandsons. I'm preaching to you. I don't care who you are in this building tonight. There comes a time when the heart gets so hungry for Jesus. There's such a cry inside. Oh, Jesus, I don't want my life to be wasted. I want you to take my life in your hands and use it. And the Lord always hears that cry and his hand comes forward and he touches one here. He touches another here. I'm not talking about getting saved. I'm not talking about just, you know, surrendering your heart to the Lord. I'm talking about one who's already surrendered. And, and somebody that says, oh, Jesus, I want a heart for you. I want my life to count. I want you to use me. And out of that hunger and out of that thirst comes the hand of Jesus. Lays it on the head. The life is never the same. Hallelujah. In Psalms uh, 139, David tells us what life is. Is like for anybody who Jesus has touched. I want you to go to Psalm 139, if you will, please. Psalm 139. I'm going to give you seven ways that David shows us that you can know that God's hand has been touched upon you. You can know it. Psalm 139. Let me hear the leaves rustle. Psalm 139. Now look at me, please, before we go any further. <clears throat> I didn't, I'm, I'm not here tonight to just yell and scream like I usually do. I make a lot of noise in this pulpit sometimes. But I have, a, I have a mission from the Lord tonight. Because the cry of my heart for a long time has been, Oh God, raise up out of this congregation young men and women to be missionaries and pastors and evangelists. Send them out in the harvest. So get a hold of drug addicts and, and those who, who've, who've, uh, would, the devil would say their lives have been wasted and take these lives. Oh God, raise up people that will have the hand of the Lord placed upon them and say, Lord, take it as a sacrifice now. And that's the mission that God's called me on tonight. You see, uh, Pastor Dave, I don't think I can remember any time like that in my past life. I don't remember. But you see, there could have been a time that you've forgotten about when you were younger. Some place in the back, way in the back in your past, before you knew anything about it. Was there some little cry when you were five or six years old even? There was a little cry and a hunger, oh Jesus, touch me. Jesus, I want to know you. Could it be a grandma, grandpa, a mother, a father, an uncle, or aunt, somebody that came into your house, came to your apartment, 
and you didn't know it, you were just a little child, and they laid hands upon you and said, Jesus, touch this child. Could it be one of these that we dedicate to the Lord and we anoint him with oil and say, Jesus, set them apart? And many times I pray for children, we dedicate God, put your hand on them, touch them, change their lives, use them. I don't know whether you can look back in your life and say, I had a time like that. It could have been later in life. It could have been five years ago, ten years ago. I don't care how, what your age is, but there was a time. If God touched you, there was a time. There's some way that God will make you know by his Holy Spirit. Yes, Brother Dave, I sit here tonight and I know that I had a touch from the Lord. I really had a touch from the hand of God. There are many of you can say that who are listening to me right now. But if you don't know, you say, I would like to know whether or not the Lord has touched me in a special way. Now, folks, he's no respecter of persons. And I'm not trying to build a certain group of people up as, as being something special. But, but there is something unique about what I'm talking about when the Lord, I don't know how he chooses. I know he doesn't choose on beauty. I know he doesn't choose on strength, human strength. I don't think he chooses just on intelligence alone, because I'm a good example of all of that, that he didn't choose because of. Now, he can use all of these things. I don't know why he would choose you I, any more than I know why he chose me. But I want you to go with me into the 139th Psalm, and I'm going to give you seven ways to know whether or not God's hand has touched you. The hand of Jesus has been stretched out and touched you. And if Jesus has touched you, if these seven things are at work in your life, Mark it down. You'll never get away from it. I don't care if you backslide. I don't care if you try to give yourself to the devil. I don't care what you do. You're not going to get away from this. So you might as well surrender tonight. It's the hand of Jesus. All right. Seven ways. And the Holy Ghost gave me this. And it's all right here in the 139th Psalm. All right. Number, wait, number one way to know. Whether Jesus has put his hand upon you to set you apart, to use you. Number one, there will be times you will feel very, very close to God. You will feel a drawing, a pulling toward him. Listen to it. It's right here in uh, the first verse that I read to you. Let's start verse one. Oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down, sitting, my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. You compass my path, my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. And I look at me, please. Is there something in you? And I want you to listen very, very closely to what I'm saying, because the Holy Spirit just put on my heart. Do you find yourself losing interest in what other people are doing? You, you look at the people that are doing stupid, foolish things. Young person, let me ask you, do you sometimes feel like you're out of place? Do you feel like you don't fit? You look around you and say, that's stupid. I don't want to do that. And everybody's all excited about it. Everybody's having fun doing this. And, and you're over here saying, that's stupid. That's not right. Everybody tries to get you to be involved in something that's evil and wicked. There's something in you that draws back. And and you feel condemned. You feel convicted. There's a conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's because the Lord's building a wall around you. Because he wants to touch you. He wants to use you. He's put his hand on you. So whatever he touches, he protects. He's putting a wall around you. And you're different. You, You somehow know. It's not because you think you're great and sometimes you think very, very insignificant of yourself. But I have, there's something that keeps pulling you. I've had that ever since I was eight years old. Something keeps drawing me back to Jesus. Even through confusion, even when I had doubts and fears, there was always something pulling at me. It was the Lord calling me, pulling me, saying, David, come to me. 
come to me. Every time I go to church, every time I hear a missionary, I feel the pull, the tongue. It's the tongue of the Holy Ghost. Do you, do you feel that tongue? When you sit in a Holy Ghost meeting, do you feel that pull toward the Lord? When you're walking these streets and you see everybody around you laying on the streets and drunk and high, and there's something in you that says, Jesus, I may not be where I'm at, but I thank you. And I, I'm not on the streets. I thank you for what you've done for me. There is something in your heart that is drawn to the Lord. You can't explain. Others around you, many of them won't have that drawing. Oh, occasionally they would, but there's a constant drawing in your heart toward the Lord. He said, he surrounded me. What, what it means is God has you cornered. I mean, God says, hey, I, I have a purpose for your life. You're not going to waste your life like everybody around you. When I'm talking about those sinner friends around you and others. You're not going to waste your life. You're not going to be comfortable with that. I'm going to make you feel out of place here. You're going to feel out of place in school. You're going to feel out of place. Folks, I felt out of place all through my school years. I felt out of place. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be active in school. But you know, when God touches you, nothing Works but him. You're part, you're here and you're doing what everybody else does. You're a part of it, but you're still not a part of it. There's something there that draws you apart. Hallelujah. You've beset me behind and before. There under, there'll be times you'd understand why you feel like you feel. There'll be times you wonder if even God is with you. But then that passes and there's always that drawing. But, oh, Jesus, I still love you. There's something there. You don't understand the things of God yet. You may have some deep problems inside your heart. But there's something in you. You care for people. You see, the the one who has the hand of Jesus placed on him, he puts a caring concern for people. You know, I can tell the young people, I can tell boy or girl, or teenager has the hand of Jesus on them, while everybody else around them, all their friends are laughing at ugly people and fat people and skinny people like I was and people with marks on their face and people that are uh, crippled and deformed and everybody around them is making fun. This one goes up and makes a friend of that one. Makes a friend. There's there's something there where everybody is is making fun of things, and you see it is different. You you have a heart almost like there's a crying inside when you see people hurting, because the Lord's giving you a caring heart. When He touches you, He gives you concern and care about other people. That's what He did for me. That's when I came to to New York uh, years ago when I saw the picture of seven boys indicted for murder. I wept over those boys and I said, Jesus, you know, here in New York City, they're saying, give them the electric chair. And people were saying, even Christians in the church said they ought to lock them up for life and throw the key away. But there was a, a young preacher down in Texas who was weeping over them. said, oh, Jesus, has anyone ever talked to them about you? Has anybody ever talked to them about their soul? And I felt grief and it was that weeping. I wept all the way to New York City. I got kicked out of that murder trial, and I wept. I wept all through this city, and I wept for drug addicts and alcoholics, and that's why today there are teen challenge centers all over the world, because years ago, the Lord said, I'm going to surround you, and I'm going to give you a caring heart, and I'm going to draw you to myself. Do you have a caring heart? And do you know, God lets you know that, Brother Dave, I know. I, maybe I don't care like I should, but I know when people around me or making fun. I don't make fun. I'm not a part of that. Okay, number one. We've got to hurry on here. Number two. You can never get away from the voice of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you go, there he is. You can't get away from the Holy Ghost. Jonah heard the voice of the Lord. God put his hand on Jonah. And Jonah tried to run. Now, 
almost everyone who has the hand of God, many, many try to run from it. I tried to run from the hand of Jesus. You can't run from it. Jonah winds up in the belly of well, and God takes him down to the very gates of hell. He goes down into the depths, and Jonah thought that he had failed God and that God could never save him again. But he couldn't get away. He said, in the belly of the well, I cried out, and the Lord heard me again. This is a wonderful thing when the Lord puts his hand upon you. You can never get away from the still small voice. You can't get away from the voice of the Holy Spirit because he keeps speaking to you. Jeremiah said, how can any hide himself in a secret place that I shall not see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Listen to me, please. When I was preparing... This message, the Holy Spirit told me to stop right here because there were going to be people in this church tonight hearing me. This simple, simple message. The Lord told me there are going to be a few adults here and there may be some teenagers as well and young people. But God made it clear that there's some of you having a Jonah experience right now. You are trying to run from the Lord. I believe there may be four or five ministers here that have been... You, you just have had it. You, you are ready to say that's it. That's it. I know that as sure as I stand here. I'm speaking into the spirit, into the heart, as some in the balcony here in the main floor, wherever you're at. You say, I've had it. I can't take it anymore. I'm, I'm going my own way. But let me inform you, please. You can do that. You can go your own way if God hadn't put his hand on you. Jonah could have stayed in Tarsus. The Lord would have let him go and wouldn't even uh, taken him through the belly of the well if God had laid his hand on him. But see, when the Lord has his hand on you, you can't run. The Holy Ghost will hound you until he brings you back. There's nothing worse than the hound of heaven. And the Holy Ghost will hound you. Do you ever hear of Holy Ghost miserables? You try to run from God and you see what happens. You get out of the will of God and you see what happens. If you think you're down now, if you think it's hard now, just wait. Because the Lord's not about to let you go. I've known of ministers who've walked out on their ministries. And they thought, well, I'm just going to get a, I, I'm just going to get a job. I'm, going to, uh, I'm not going to preach anymore. I've had it. Better to sell insurance. Better to do something. These, now, these are all honorable uh, careers. But you see, when God calls you, and when God says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men, he's not going to let you sell insurance or anything else. He's going to get you back into the boat fishing. And I'm going to tell you, whoever you are in this service now, God told me to tell you that he has his hand on you. And if he put his hand on you, you can't get away. You try anything you want, it's not going to work. You say, Brother Wilkinson, I, I know people that have been running for years. Ah, but the story hadn't been told yet. God still, the Holy Ghost will, will speak and speak till the last breath. Number three, even if you try to make your bed in hell, his hand will still uphold you. Look at verse eight. Verse 8, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. Look at me, please. When it says, if I make my bed in hell, it means, uh, here's somebody that's in rebellion. Listen closer. Somebody's in rebellion says, look. I can't take this anymore. I don't see the hand of God on my life. I don't, I just don't want this anymore. And there's a spirit of rebellion rises up and says, I'm going my own way. And really what it means in, in the original Hebrews, I give myself over to the devil. I just give myself. I'm going to give myself into hell. I'm going to lay down in my sin. And, and the psalmist, David is, is the, the psalmist here is saying, if, if, even if I, I say that's enough and I give up and I try to make my bed in hell. Even there your hand will hold me. The hand that touched you will hold you. 
You say, Brother Wilkerson, you, you're trying to say that I can never backslide. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that God knows why some people give up. He knows the despair. He knows people come to the end of the rope. He knows that they come to their wit's end. And he knows we make stupid mistakes. But when the Lord puts his hand on you, he's not going to let you go. He will go with you into your deepest despair. He'll go into your deepest sin. Then he's going to say, I'm not letting go. I'll put my hand on you. I am not letting go. How many have left uh, Timothy house? Walked out, went out, said that's enough, and they go out for a night? A week? And all hell breaks loose? And suddenly they find themselves in a room with their Bible again? And they're looking in and the Lord said, I'll cleanse your blood. And something rises up and they get on the phone and says, can I come back? What is it? It's the hand of God. You tried to make your bed in hell and God says, I have my hand on you. Hallelujah. The devil tried to destroy my son Gary. Came home one day as a senior in high school. Said, threw himself in the bed. He said, Dad, there's no God. There's no God. The devil tried literally to destroy him. The devil wanted to make his bed in hell. The devil wanted that boy to say, go out and be like the rest. Go out and give yourself to the devil. Just go out and give yourself. And I I was so shocked, and yet the Lord didn't let me show it on my face. And I, I couldn't reason with him because sometimes when you go through this testing of your faith as a young person, no dad, no mom, nobody can help you. You're all alone with Jesus. But the Lord, if you have a heart for him, he'll bring you through that. If you just say, Lord, I don't understand, help me understand, he'll give you the understanding. And all I could do was pray. For three months, my son went through that. But I know one thing, the hand of God was on him, and I didn't have to worry. I prayed for him, but I knew God was going to hold him through it. Some of you are going through the test of your life, and God's hand is on you. And my Bible says, even though you make your bed in hell, I'm going to hold you. Even the devil tries to destroy you, I'm going to bring you out. Glory to God. Let that be hope for you here tonight. Okay. Let's see, let's go to number, what was that number? Let's go to number four. By the way, God's hand is a restraining hand. He sure is. I'll tell you what. I have experienced God's restraining power, his hand keeping me from doing stupid, dumb things, from doing sinful things. All my life, I felt God pulling me back and says, all right, others can do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. I've got my hand on you. You can't go that way. And God pulled me back. Have you ever felt God's restraining hand? It's on you. He pulls you back from the brink. He keeps pulling on you. Thank God for that. He lets you go so far and you won't go any further. You notice that? That's because his hand is on you. It's restraining you. Thank God for that. Number four, when God keeps breaking through your darkness with light, verses 11, 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light unto me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Right, look at me, please. This is so important. David said, Thou art my lamp, O Lord. The Lord will lighten my darkness. In verse 6, Thou hast laid, in Psalms 88, I don't, I'm not going to read it. If you go to Psalms 88 tonight before you go to bed, you'll hear one of the most mournful, pitiful chapters and books in all the Bible. Absolute. Oh God. You have forgotten me. You've laid me in chains. I'm in prison. I'm like a forgotten man and and all the confusion and the hurt and the pain. David knew what that was all about. Darkness. And in Psalms 88, the writer says, you left me in darkness. And in the Hebrew, it says, you left me in darknesses. Plural. Not just one darkness, but darkness. And you have left me in a pit. 
And the writer says, Lord, there's darkness, but the darkness hideth not from the light. And here's the difference. When the Lord has his hand on you, there may be times that you go through darkness. Not just one darkness, but many darknesses. But Jesus always comes through with his light. He always gives you peace and rest. And you begin to see the face of Jesus in your trouble. I visited not too long ago. I told you about a young lady in Yonkers Hospital. She's been there for months. She to come to this church. She used to be in a wheelchair here. And uh, I went to the hospital. And I heard a tragic story. You talk about darkness. Here's a young woman that is, had suffered at the hands of doctors being misdiagnosed, mistreated. And those mistreatments and miscalculations, she had one serious problem after another in a hospital for months. And a few months ago, a sore broke out. I think it was on her leg. and She went to the hospital. I don't know if gangrene had said it. I, I don't remember all the details of it. But she was being suddenly rushed into uh, the operating room. And she thought they were just going to cut around the sore. When she woke up, was in her room, she reached out. She could feel pain. And she reached out to feel where the, the sore had been. And there was no leg. They took her leg. Evidently, I, I suppose her mother had signed the papers. I don't know. The, I don't, didn't get all the details. But she said, Pastor Dave, I woke up without a leg. And I thought, oh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to minister to her. She wound up ministering to me. She began to smile. And she said, you know, this, this was awful. This has been tragic. But she said, I love him. And he's been precious to me. And he's been real to me. You see, the hand of the Lord had been placed on her. And you can always tell it when the darkness comes, when the trials come, and when the confusion comes. Because the, this person is the hand of God. On it. They, they, they don't run around complaining and murmuring. Oh, there'll, there'll be a shock. There'll, there'll be something to come out and say, God, why at first? But then the heart begins to settle down and Jesus begins to come and they remember the touch of God. And, and this young lady, she just began to worship the Lord because the, all her darkness could not hide the light. Hallelujah. Do you have that in you in any measure at all? Are you able in your darkness to still worship him? Are you still able to praise the Lord and the light breaks through? That's one of the evidences of the hand of God upon your life. Let me give you number five. If you have a growing knowledge in you that your birth was not in vain, but God had a plan for your life, even when you're in your mother's womb, even in your mother's room, womb, verses 13 to 18. For thou hast possessed my range, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eye did see my substance yet being unperfect. In thy book all my members were written, which in continued were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they're more in number than I then the sand, when I wake, I am still with thee. Look at me, please. David said, Lord, I know something. I know that you called me when I was in my mother's womb. I know. Folks, listen. Young people, listen to me good now. I know this as sure as I stand here and I have the mind of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus has touched you, you're going to know it. The Holy Spirit's going to know it. By showing you somewhere along the line, he's going to start showing you. My life has a purpose to it. God is not going to let me waste my life. I wasn't born 
My mother didn't bring me into this world just to end up as a waste of drug addict or an alcoholic or a bum. I wasn't born for that. I was born for God's eternal purpose for my life. And even before I was born, God named me in the womb. My dad and mom may have given me a name, but the Lord has a name for me also that he chose. And even when I was being formed in my mother's womb, the Lord put his hand upon me. He, the Lord didn't put his hand on me just when I was down there. He put his hand on me when I was in the womb. In fact, before I was born, he had thoughts, good thoughts toward me. He said, I've got a plan for David. I've got a plan. And there are many of you sitting here right now. The Lord had a plan for you, even in your mother's womb. I don't care if your mother was a drunkard. God could have put his hand upon you. He's, and there's a sense, there's a sense. It's not just, I don't call it a sense of destiny. I have known all my life. I never felt special. I never felt great. I've had a hard time all my life with feeling inferior. That's not been it. But I've known. I know it when I pray. I know it when I preach. I know it everywhere I go. I know it when the enemy comes against me. I know it every waking hour that when I was a baby in my mother's womb, Jesus put his hand on me. Now, it, you, you could be like Ernie Shaver. Jesus could have called, Jesus didn't call him 10 years ago. Jesus called him before he was born and put his hand upon him. He had to go through so much trial and testing before he came into the realization. But the Lord had his hand all the way, even though he made his bed in hell. And so many of you here right now, it took a long time, but God had his hand on you. He has his hand on you tonight. Hallelujah. There'll be a voice in you that keeps saying, you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. God says, I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to use you. Hallelujah. Number six, when you grieve, are you ready for this? When you grieve the way sinners treat the Lord, and when you feel hurt over the sinfulness of wicked people, that's in verse 19. And 22, look at it. Sure, surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, O bloody men. They speak against thee wickedly, O God. Thy enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Now that doesn't mean you hate people, but you hate their sin. Young, young people, I'm going to ask teenagers here. You heard last week about the two teenage lovers who gave birth to a baby in a motel. And the autopsy shows that the baby evidently was beaten on the head and was killed. How do you feel about that? Do you have a cry inside? Do you cry about that? Is there a cry? You see, the, the, the amazing thing is that if they had waited just, uh, or if they had just called an abortion doctor 10 minutes before, and he'd have brought his suction machine in and poked a hole, turned the baby around and poked a hole in the brain and sucked the brain out, it would have been a legal death. It would have been legal. Maybe 15 minutes apart. I don't justify what those kids did, but there has to be a grief in your heart where we have a society that has robbed children of their fear of death, robbed children of their value of life, so that these things can be done? You, you see, young person, are you here tonight? And when you see all the wicked things are being done against the name of Jesus, does it grieve you? When you hear your friends curse, you have a grief in your sight? Is there a sadness they're taking the Lord's name in vain? If you had the touch of God on you, you hate sin. You hate it. You can't go to a movie like I preached this morning. You can't go to a movie where the name of Jesus is cursed. You can't sit 
and watch a VCR movie where the name of Jesus Christ is taken in vain because there's a cry in your heart. And you'll turn it off immediately because you have a grief in your heart. You grieve the way they treat your Savior. They, you grieve about it. Hallelujah. It was just like, uh, I have to tell you this. When Gary was just about eight years old or so, my wife doesn't want me to tell him. I don't know, but she was supposed to be back from the hairdresser. I had to leave for Newark Airport. And she wasn't there. And I had to just, I bundled Gary up. We rushed to the Newark airport. I didn't know what to do. So he didn't have clothes or anything, uh, clothes on his back. And so I took him with me to uh, Minneapolis. I got to Minneapolis and called. She was in panic. And so the stewardess overheard me and she said, Reverend, she said, look, I'm going right back in a flight. He's such a sweet kid. He said, she said, I'll put him in first class. I'll watch over him. Have your wife come and meet him. So I said, fine. He gets on the airplane and that gal sits beside him and lights up a cigarette. And he starts preaching at her. He said, Jesus doesn't like that. Jesus doesn't like that. But that, that sounds, it sounds childish, but folks, there, there was something in the heart already. You see, there was something there. <laughs> I, I have to finish the last, the last one, number six. No, number seven. Wow, number seven. All right. This is this is so important. Now, before we close, verse twenty-three and twenty-four. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. If you have the hand of Jesus on you, you don't want anything in your life that's evil or wicked. You don't want anything that would grieve the Lord in your life. You know, some uh, a prayer card was handed to me. I'm going to close in just a minute. This is evidently from a teenager. It says, is it a sin to listen to music? Like I'm listening to rap songs without explicit lyrics. Uh, will I go to hell? That's what it says. Will I go to hell? Last Sunday, I had three young teenagers, girls back here, and they said, Brother Dave, uh, we're, we're listening to rap music. Is, is, is this wrong? You know, when you start asking, the Holy Ghost has convicted you if you have to ask. Uh, the young person uh, didn't put a name, just an initial. And I don't want to embarrass you or anything else, but I want to tell you something. It all depends on whether you want the hand of God on you. all depends if you want God to use your life. Now, if you want to be like everybody else, I don't, I don't think your mom and dad can tell you the kind of music you should listen to. Because, you see, they, they said college is a place where young rebels go to get even with their parents. To, to, to give themselves over to the devil, just get, uh, get even with their parents. They, they don't want anybody to tell them. Listen, no preacher can tell you. Your dad and mom can't tell you. But I'll tell you who will tell you. That's the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what. The Bible says here, those that have the hand of Jesus upon them, they're not afraid to be searched. They're not a, they don't hold on to it. Says, well, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what anybody says. This is my music. This is my thing. I do it. Whether it's music, whatever it may be, that's evil or sinful. If you have the hand of Jesus on you, you back away and say, Jesus, turn the light on. Show me. And you, Lord, if this is wrong, you show me. I'll lay it down because I want your hand on me. I want you to use me. I want my life to count. That makes all the difference in the world. I ask you, you don't have to all, all seven of these things that work in your life. But I wonder how many of these things are at work in your life. If you can sit here tonight and say, Pastor David, I know what you said tonight. These things are in my life. Uh, this grief of sin, all you're talking about, my willingness to lay anything down that's unlike Jesus. All of these things at work in my life, or many of these things at work in my life. Listen, don't go the hard way. Come the right way. Say, Jesus, I'm going to surrender to your hand right now. 
I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit in the next 10 minutes to speak to everybody in this building 21 years of age and under in a special way. If you've not yet had the hand of Jesus on you, there's something in you says, Brother David, I want the hand of Jesus on me. I want Jesus to touch me in this meeting tonight. Let's make it 25 and under. Let's make it those who are single only first. And I'll get to the rest of you. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to go all through balcony, the main floor. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to go all through this church. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to put his hand to find everyone that's reaching out. If you say, Brother David, I want Jesus to touch my life tonight. I want you to get up out of your seat and come down here and let me pray for you right now. Because where you're coming to right now is the touch of his hand. You're coming for the touch of his hand all through this place. Heavenly Father, find every young person, 25 and under, find every one of the Lord, that you're desiring right now that you want to touch. Lord, bring them down to this altar and let them stand here and say, Jesus, tonight, I want to give my whole life to you. I want everything to be given to you, Jesus. Touch me. Touch me. Jesus, put your hand on me. Look at me, please. Every one of you up here right now. Folks, this, I told you it's going to be, I, I, I told the choir before we started, there's going to be a little different service tonight. It's, it's a little different, it's a much different altar call too. I wish all of you out there can see what the choir and I and the musicians see here. So many young people. So many ready to give their lives and everything to the Lord. How old are you, son? 22? Mm -hmm. There's a hunger. It's a reaching, isn't there, in your heart? Great reaching toward the Lord. I feel drawn toward that. Some others all over here. The Lord just, in a meeting like this, only eternity is going to tell. How many are going to look back to this service tonight? The simplest, probably one of the simplest sermons I've ever preached. And you're going to look back to this night. Honey, you will. Yeah. How old are you? 16? Will you give me your hand? Lord, you, you're, you're giving a tender, broken spirit to her. You've already touched her. Now, Lord, let her know it. God, let her follow through with you now. Let nothing hinder the call of God. Nothing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Wonderful. Congregation, pray with me right now. I'm going to pray that God come down right now and touch these lives. Come on now, everybody that loves the Lord, every parent and everyone else, let's pray. Father, I pray for these right now that are standing at this altar area. Lord, go deep by your Holy Spirit. Go deep into their hearts. Go deep, Lord. Let nothing be missed. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, you're walking among us. Will you walk among these in front of me? And put your arm around them. And touch them. Touch them. So that they'll never be the same. Never be the same. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want everybody to come forward and raise your hands. Raise both hands to heaven. Just raise them up. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. This will be the, the, something that, that you're reaching out to the Lord for. Pray this with me from the innermost part of your being. Jesus. Louder, please. Jesus. I reach out to you from the depths of my heart and I cry to you. I want my life to count. I want you to use me. Touch me, Jesus. Put your hand upon me. Call me. Touch me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Give me power from on high. Help me to pray. And seek your face and to know your will for my life. Now let me pray for you while you have your hands raised. Holy Spirit, I ask you, you let there be a cry come forth from the innermost being. A cry from these. Lord, you're beginning a work in their hearts right now. Only eternity is going to tell. 
that this is the night Jesus came, touched the heart, touched the spark of life, and said, this is your night. Separate yourself from the world. Come out from among them, be separate and clean. Give me your heart. Give me your music. Give me your life. Give me your talents. Give me everything. Give it to me. And I'll use you. I'll change you. Amen, amen, amen. Now, will you just keep your hands raised and thank Jesus right now? Thank him in your own words. Just give him thanks. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I give you praise. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.